Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond speaks to two faculty at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Sabra Klein and Rosemary Morgan. They talk about the impact that sex and gender have on the current pandemic, with the coronavirus killing many more men than women. Let's listen. I'm here today with Sabra Klein, a virologist at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and Rosemary Morgan, a social scientist at the school. Today, we're going to talk about the sex and gender effects in the current coronavirus pandemic. Let's start with terminology. Talk to me what the difference is when we start talking about sex and gender. Sabra? Stephanie, thank you so much. So when we talk about sex and gender, what we're really trying to do is make the complementary but yet distinction between our biology, which is what we refer to as our sex, and so biological differences between males and females that can be mediated by our reproductive hormones, the presence of different reproductive tissues, even the presence of different sex chromosome complements. So in humans, women having two X chromosomes and male having an X and a Y chromosome and the genes that get that are on there and that can be differentially expressed in men and women and alter our biology. Gender, in contrast, is what I'm going to allow Rosemary to to define for us because this is specifically her expertise. Great. Thank you, Sabra. So gender differs from sex in that it considers more about our social life. So it is really thinking about sort of the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, attributes, and opportunities that any society considers appropriate for both men and women, boys and girls, as well as people of other genders. So it really is different from sex in that it is socially constructed and context specific. Well, thank you both. In this current pandemic, we're seeing that men seem to be um, dying more from the coronavirus than women. For example, I've seen statistics out of Italy where men accounted for 70% of the deaths. And in Spain, new data suggests that twice as many men as women have died. So why are men more vulnerable? Is it biological? Is it behavioral? The honest truth, we don't know. At this moment, though, just as you said, across diverse countries around the world, um, where countries have disaggregated and compared data for the number of cases of confirmed infection, as well as severity of disease. So cases resulting in hospitalization and in particular admission into intensive care units, as well as deaths. What we are consistently finding in those countries that have disaggregated their data is that while we do not see differences between men and women in the number of cases, we are seeing a significant male bias in admission into ICUs around the world, as well as in mortality from this current coronavirus. So what really is very obvious is that being male is a risk factor for more severe outcome during this pandemic, and we really don't fully understand why. As a biologist, I, I, I immediately start thinking about biological differences between the sexes that can contribute to why it is or how it is that disease severity can be different between men and women. And one difference that I've spent much of my career studying is the greater immune responses that we typically see in females as compared with males. And this greater immunity, it can be, it can be a blessing or it can be a curse. 
It can be a blessing because in many cases, and what we're hypothesizing about right now is that greater antiviral immunity. So those immune responses, they're going to be really critical for recognizing that this virus has entered the body and responding and initiating the subsequent responses that are going to be really important for clearing the virus from our body. These types of responses are often greater in women as compared with men. It is also important that, you know, to think about behavioral act- action. So just as Sabra immediately thinks about sort of the biological differences, I think about differences between men and women as a result of different norms, you know, about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, different behaviors, different roles. And while we still need some more data, we do know there are differences, for example, between, uh, in some context, some countries, smoking rates between men and women. In China, a lot more men smoke than women. In Italy and Spain, the gap is smaller. We do see a higher prevalence of men, although it is very important to think about it by age as well. Often we see a higher gap in the older age groups, which are we've seen more vulnerable. There's an age interaction than in younger groups between men and women. We see data around hand washing too, about how men are less likely to wash their hands, which we know is a public health measure as well. And we also know, uh, and this links very much to biology, about comorbidities, which means if someone has diabetes or high blood pressure, they are more vulnerable and with diabetes and high blood pressure, men often engage in behavioral activities that put them more at risk, like smoking, drinking, uh, bad eating habits, things like that. So we, it is important to think about both together and how they are interacting. And to build on what Rosemary just said, these comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, all of which in this current pandemic are being shown to be associated with a worse outcome. And in many cases, it is men that are suffering from more of these comorbidities than are women. And while behavior, just as Rosemary beautifully articulated, is absolutely playing a role, we also know that testosterone in men has been shown to play a role in things like mediating some of the differences that we see in the development of hypertension, just as one example. And the reason I assume that smoking could be particularly relevant in this case is because this is a lung disease. Oh, correct. Yes. So there, there really is. There's a lot of interest in how anything, whether that's smoking, there's growing interest in lung cancer and how lung cancer, again, because you're affecting the lungs and how that may make a person more susceptible. So these sex differences, Sabra, you talked about in immune systems, uh, has this been borne out in other outbreaks? I know that you've researched the flu, for example. Men are more likely to get the flu. Is that right? So what we find absolute with the flu is, and, and it kind of brings up something that Rosemary brought up, um, the sex difference has an interaction with our age. So what we found during the 2009 flu pandemic, which now feels like that was ages ago, what we found was that during our reproductive years, so in people who were roughly 18 to 50 years of age, it was women who actually suffered more severe outcomes. One factor there was pregnancy. So there you have a sex-specific factor that can contribute to worse outcomes from infectious diseases. But from data from countries that disaggregated and analyzed non-pregnant women compared to men, and that was true in Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, they were reporting that just being female, so even among women who were not pregnant, you were seeing a worse outcome. So this gave us something to go back to the lab and start to study. And when we went back to the lab where we could be a little bit more mechanistic, using animal models, using cell culture systems, what we found was that greater immunity that I told you about in females that can be both a blessing but can also be a curse, here it was actually a curse. Here, the robust immune response associated with the cytokine storm, 
this increased amount of proteins being produced by our immune system in response to the infection is actually what can sometimes cause disease. So pathology or detrimental outcomes from infection can be caused not only by an inability to control a virus infection, but it can actually be caused by our immune system exhibiting too robust of a response to the presence of this virus. So for flu, for example, that's precisely what we saw. But in older ages, it's males. So once you kind of get rid of those estrogens, we enter menopause, we really start to see a reduction actually in immunity in females. And that drop in immunity seems to, in some cases, protect us from the inflammation that can be initiated by infection. So we wouldn't know this if we didn't disaggregate and think about you know, sex-specific differences in our immune system. Rosemary, I wanted to ask you about sort of, while men are bearing the brunt of the most severe cases of the coronavirus, more women are really on the front lines of this pandemic. They're 70% of health workers around the world. You know, they're overrepresented in professions where exposure to the virus is high, nurses, nursing home staff, even cashiers. What does this pandemic mean for women? It's an excellent question. So while we are seeing higher mortality in men, you know, that we do see some differential impacts in women. And you rightly said that women make up the majority of the global health and social workforce. There are healthcare workers, there are care providers, you know, there are nursing home staff and nurses, they're working in also like grocery stores and, and restaurants as well. And that, as a result of that, not only does it put women at more risk of exposure to being infected. They also are working in often more precarious jobs. By that I mean part-time, the majority of part-time workers, majority of workers with minimum or lower wage are women, and also many of them are women of color. So when we see, you know, people losing their jobs, has high, really high economic impacts, as well as the, you know, the, the health-related impacts of, of health workers on the front line caring for those that are sick. And I think we really also need to think about what it means in terms of the equipment available. We're, we're seeing lots of news reports in the media about personal protective equipment not being available, about there were some pictures of, of nurses in garbage bags with, and also like bandanas and making makeshift personal protective equipment and that they're just not being protected. So here we have you know, that intersection of what roles that women are giving uh, and doing and their vulnerability to exposure and infection. I also see very few female faces, for example, though, when I see pictures of the US coronavirus response team. Does having such a small amount of representation in a body that's making such important decisions, does that have an impact? Most definitely it does. So even in, in the global health leadership as well, we said the prevalence of women in the global health workforce is 70%, but they only make up 25% of, of those leadership positions. And if you look at the sort of the task force and leadership around the COVID-19 pandemic, it's majority men. The, you know, the White House Coronavirus Task Force is over 90% men. In the UK, the entire task force are men, right? And with, given women's, you know, frontline interaction with communities, you know, it's concerning that they're not more fully incorporated into these decision-making bodies. You know, their, their socially prescribed care roles put them really in prime positions to identify trends at the local level you know, that might start be at the start of the outbreak, that might help improve responses. And we do know, we, there is evidence that says that the more diverse decision-making bodies are and are, the better they are. And when women are not included in these decision-making bodies, it's much less likely that their specific needs uh, are going to be addressed and recognized. Well, ladies, this has been a fascinating conversation, and I can't thank you both enough for joining me. Stephanie, thank you for bringing attention to these issues. Yes, thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. 
Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.